Good morning and welcome to The Law Show. Bob Kerrigan with you this morning and the other lawyers here, Kerrigan, Estes, Rankin, McLeod, and Thompson, will be talking about various aspects of the law. We answer your text messages. We try to do it uh, simultaneously um, while we're on the air. So if you text us this morning, for example, and you have a question, we'll try to get back to you immediately. Sometimes it takes a little while depending on what the question is. We are reluctant to give advice uh, based on a text message for a particular case. You just can't know enough about it. And we don't want to say something or provide advice to you that might uh, be detrimental to you. If we knew more about the facts, we might have um, a, a different take on it. So um, the questions that you send us or the text messages, we can follow up if it's an individual case. And if it's a general question, then we can respond to that um, pretty fast. In fact, we do it on the air. One of the questions we've gotten in the past, uh, actually several times, is how do I discharge a lawyer if I can't communicate with my lawyer, whatever the reason might be. And sometimes you just make a mistake. I mean, we've all been in a situation, I think many people have anyway, where you have a physician, for example, that you just have a personality conflict with. Uh, might be a wonderful doctor, but uh, you just you don't jihaw, you don't you don't communicate very well, and you you're not doing the doctor any favor to stay with the doctor, and it's a, it's the same thing with a lawyer. You're not doing the lawyer any favor to stay with a lawyer because you're basically not going to get along with this lawyer. You're not going to be it's going to invade your trust relationship with that lawyer, and so it's sometimes best to separate. Now we never encourage that because. Um, it's just not good for people to change lawyers for no reason at all. If you have a legitimate reason, you can't communicate with your lawyer, you, you have a suspicion. We all, we, we have, I used to say we have this little voice of judgment on our shoulder. And that little voice of judgment is telling you, this lawyer's in trouble. They've got an alcohol problem. They have a drug problem. They are not attending to their business the way they should. When I talk to them, they don't seem to know anything about my case. I can't even communicate with them. I'm constantly having to deal with somebody that is works for them, and they say the lawyer's not available. I can't get my questions answered. Well, it's time to find another lawyer, okay? I recommend that you make that final effort to tell the lawyer, I want to communicate with you. I don't want to communicate with other people. I have a question. I have a legitimate question that I want you to answer, or I have some... Uh, issues that I would like to address with you. So again, the idea here is uh, don't make matters worse by staying with somebody that uh, that you don't care for. Now I must address this. Uh, my longtime friend, I've known John Morgan for years and Morgan and Morgan, but he's got a commercial running right now that uh, I take some offense to, um, and it's this. He says in the commercial, that uh, they've grown and uh, they have a lot of lawyers. I don't know, several hundred lawyers that he has working for him um, all over. And that uh, if your law firm is small, then maybe your law firm isn't as good because they haven't grown as fast or they're not as big or they don't have as many lawyers. Well, big doesn't mean better uh, in practicing law. And you only have one lawyer. You don't have 300 lawyers. You have one. And so the question is, what qualifications and experience does the lawyer that Morgan and Morgan picks for you have? What experience do they have? What competence level do they have? Are they rated with the highest ethical and legal ability rating you can get from Martindale Hubble? That's called an AV rating. Every partner in Kerrigan, Estes, Rankin, McLeod, and Thompson has an AV rating. Well, Morgan and Morgan can't advertise that because all of the lawyers they have working for them don't have AV ratings. But you have a legitimate right to ask that question of the lawyer that they assign to you, and they will assign to you the, a lawyer to you. You won't be represented by anybody named Morgan, or certainly not by John, but he'll have some lawyer assigned to you. You, you will not have picked that lawyer. They will have picked you. Well, it's reversed with a small firm like us, um, and that is you pick the lawyer. And you pick the lawyer based on the lawyer's credentials and their ability. And so you would want a board-certified lawyer. Yeah, that's the Florida Bar's way of distinguishing lawyers that are experts in civil litigation. 
and at Kerrigan, Estes, Rankin, and McLeod, and Thompson, we're all board certified. All the partners are board certified. We don't have associates. So at Morgan & Morgan, they can't advertise that they are all board certified because they're not. They can't advertise that their lawyers have obtained multi-million dollar verdicts because all of them haven't. Some may have, but all of them have not. And so the idea here is that you should pick a lawyer based on their individual qualifications and experience and their ability. And fundamentally, do you get along with that lawyer? Is it a lawyer you enjoy talking to or you, you think is knowledgeable and respectful of you and your situation and communicates with you and expresses concern for you? And that's true of some lawyers with Morgan & Morgan, but you can't be assured of anything because they just assign somebody to you. But you do have a right to ask some really penetrating questions. And there's a document called a Statement of Client's Rights that tells you a lot of questions you should ask the lawyer. But we have extensive experience in civil litigation. We have for many decades. We've been in North Florida, across North Florida. Um, our lawyers have been picked as the outstanding lawyers in North Florida, the outstanding plaintiff's lawyers in three of the last five years. So we have the credentials and experience and results. You know, years ago, many years ago, there was a commercial from uh, by Avis Car Rental and Hertz. And Hertz was the giant then. I think they still are pretty pretty big. It's a, a great company, as, as is Avis. But Avis advertised that they had to try harder because they were number two. Well, we're not number two in, in relation to skill and ability, but we're number two in size, okay? So we don't have the size of a big mega firm like Morgan & Morgan, but we have skillful lawyers, board certified, highly credentialed, well experienced with many, many substantial verdicts. So why is that important? Well, you wouldn't want a doctor to operate on you that was learning. That's why they have residencies under supervision and they have fellowships and they have internships and they have all kinds of things for in their training that help them achieve a level of success that uh, assures competent medical care being provided. You, you, would, you wouldn't want a, 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 a doctor that was learning on you, okay? And I think that's what you have to be aware of if you are assigned a lawyer. How competent is this lawyer for my case? And we are not really in competition with them because we specialize in the civil litigation in these kinds of cases, but our cases involve very serious injuries or deaths. We do not have stub toe cases and hurt feeling cases and fractured finger cases and things like that. We don't do that. We have um, uh, very seriously injured people, the death claims and paralysis claims and others. We've experienced all of them. We've handled uh, all, all, all claims like this over the years, all of the partners at Kerrigan, Estes, Frank, and McLeod, and Thompson. Well, that's kind of a long advertisement, but you can be swayed by something because of the co constancy of it. You see these commercials over and over and over and over again, and you say, well, they must be pretty good. They have all these commercials. Well, that may or may not be the case because you can only have one lawyer. You can't have 200 lawyers, as I said earlier. You can have one lawyer. And that lawyer better be a good fit for you. Talk to two or three lawyers. Don't just hire somebody because you saw them on TV. Hire, talk to two or three lawyers. Interview them. Ask them questions about their competence, experience, and their time and their capacity to handle a case. But most importantly, for the depth of the lawyer's resources to take on a big, major case, it's not inconsequential that the lawyer has to have financial depth. It's critically important that the lawyer has the financial depth to handle a multi-million dollar case because you don't handle multi-million dollar cases by going on the cheap. You have to bring in the top experts you can find in whatever the field is that you're dealing with. And so it's really important to understand, does this law firm and does this lawyer have the depth, the financial depth to undertake my case. So just some of the considerations that you should ask. We're glad to answer any questions 
about it that you uh, it you have. And we do this without obligation. We review the cases without any charge to anybody. Um, many times we have to reject cases because they don't meet the threshold of what we do, and that is a very for serious injuries and death claims. But we try to refer people out to other lawyers that might do that kind of work, but we don't uh, accept every case and everybody that calls. We can't, but we uh, will at least listen to what you're saying and try to help you if we can, if we can't undertake the case. Um, I want to speak quickly about um, some of the things that are going on um, with, the, with the pariahs hanging around litigation. And one of them are these finance come one of them is a finance company that offers money to people who've been injured in an accident through the lawyer and they front the money and then they want to be paid back after the case gets settled well there's there's risk in that of course so the interest rates are higher but to me the interest rates are obscene they're just uh, offensive in charging whatever the numbers 150 percent or whatever it's just outrageous what they charge and we strongly discourage people from getting into these situations because by the time it ends and you've got to pay all this extra money back to somebody who fronted you some money in the case, it's very discouraging to people because their recovery then is limited now by the money they have to repay. But sometimes people are in such a jam, they have to do something. We strongly discourage it and want people to be aware that these are very uh uh, predatory type lending. I, I put them in the same category as payday loans and title loan companies. I don't think there is much difference in them in terms of just the predatory level of uh, financings that they charge. Question that came in on PIP versus UM. What is PIP? What's UM? Well, Mike McLeod and Randy Thompson have talked about UM um, at length. Most critical coverage get Uninsured motorist coverage, never, ever, ever reject it. What is PIP, on the other hand, personal injury protection coverage? It's $10,000 paid regardless of who's involved and regardless of fault. That's the no fault part of Florida automobile negligence law. It's PIP, P-I-P, -P, personal injury protection. It's only $10,000. In this session of the legislature, they're probably gonna do away with it. It's archaic, it's 30 years, 40 years old. $10,000 hardly gets you a cup of coffee in an emergency room anymore. So it really doesn't mean much of anything. They're going to substitute it, we hope, with bodily insurance, mandating, mandating rather that people have bodily insurance coverage in Florida, which now is not mandated. The only thing mandated in Florida now is property damage. Insurance companies want their property damage covered, but they have no concern about people that are injured in automobile accidents. That's why... We don't have bodily injury coverage mandated in Florida. And we've mentioned this before on the law show. It's one of the few states in the South that doesn't have this mandatory BI coverage. And that is the bodily injury protection coverage. And buy as much of it as you can afford. We recommend at least 25 slash 50 uh, if you can afford it all the way up to 100 slash 300 thousand coverage would be ideal if you can afford it. It is just a function of what your financial situation is. Bob Kerrigan with you on The Law Show. We've got other segments coming up this morning. I hope you'll stay with us and thank you very much for watching The Law Show and texting us with your questions. I'm Bob Kerrigan. Have you seen the young lawyer advertising standing on top of a truck? I wonder who he would hire if he fell off the truck. Maybe the lawyer who has hundreds of billboards up and down the interstate. If it happened in Florida, though, it couldn't be him because he doesn't even have a Florida law license. He wouldn't hire the lawyer who barely has time to eat with his family because he just seems too busy. Maybe the lawyer who busts down his office wall. That may not be a good place to be if another wall is crashed through. If he called us, we'd tell him well, it wasn't the brightest idea to climb up on top of the truck in the first place with the highest ethical and legal ability rating from Martindale Hubble. We represent one client at a time, and we've represented thousands of clients over the years. Your case will be handled by a board-certified partner, board-certified in civil trial by the Florida Bar. Kerrigan Estes, Rankin, McLeod, and Thompson at Kerrigan.com. 
Welcome back to The Law Show, brought to you by the firm Kerrigan, Estes, Rankin, McLeod, and Thompson. I'm Randy Thompson, and I'm happy to be talking to you this morning. We appreciate very much you watching this program. We appreciate all of the comments that we receive from you. To learn more about our individual lawyers and the individual people that will be working on your file, please go to our website, kerrigan.com, where you'll get a lot of information about each of the lawyers, what we do, what we focus on, and how we try to do the best job of helping our clients. Um, one of the things I wanna to talk to you about in this segment of today's show is when we represent minors, uh, children under the age of 18 for injuries, whether it's a car accident, whether it's a medical malpractice, whether it's a product liability claim, if we are representing minors for their injuries, there are a whole separate set of rules that sometimes apply to these children because our courts want to make sure that the money that is recovered for these children for their injuries is in fact the money for the children and money that they will be able to get to uh, when they turn of age. There's a lot of different options that apply and there are a lot of different rules and statutes that apply some of them are different based on the amount of income that the minor child will receive as a result of the jury verdict or as a result of a settlement if in fact we're able to settle the claim beforehand and so i want to pay a little attention to some of the statutes that apply in this case and it really is chapter 744 of the Florida statutes and specifically it's chapter 744.361 if you're looking this information up uh, that deal with what I want to talk to you about today which is the settlement of a minor child's injury under Florida law if the gross settlement amount is from zero to $15,000, there is a certain set of rules that we must abide by. If the amount is between 15,000 and then 50, it's actually $49,999.99. If, if the amount that the minor will net is in that range. We have a completely different set of rules. And then if the amount is above $50,000, there's yet another set of rules. So why so many rules? Why so many different checks and balances uh, to protect uh, the minor's money? Surely the parents wouldn't take that money and spend it for their own, right? Our courts say, well, we hope that, but let's make sure there's some safeguards in there. But the problem is that some of these safeguards require the hiring of additional attorneys, the hiring of additional people to meet the court's requirements in these areas. So let me, let me first of all talk to you about if the claim settles for 15,000 or jury verdict for less than or equal to $15,000, all right? So that the net amount that's gonna go to that child is somewhere between a dollar and $15,000. Then the courts have said, and our statutes say, that if no lawsuit was filed, but rather it's just trying to be settled and resolved, then no court approval is required, no legal guardianship is required, 
and no guardian ad litem is required. Ooh, well, there's some legal terms. So what does that mean? Unless the parents of a minor child have some criminal background or certain other issues, they are considered to be the legal guardian of the child and they can act and make decisions for their child and they are required to make and act decisions and, and uh, decide issues for their children. And so the courts say if, if the settlement amount is less than 15000 or equal to it, then we're going to allow the parents, unless they've got some of these felony convictions or other issues, we're going to allow them to be the guardian and we don't have to put our blessing on it and we're not going to issue any orders uh, that, that the guardian, the parents have to comply with. But if the amount goes up, if it goes to $15,001 up to $50,000, then the courts say that well, wait a minute, we want the courts to get involved in this. We want the court to at least approve of the settlement. And so the lawyer representing the family uh, has to petition the court, has to give the judge in writing all of the information about why the claim settled or if it was a verdict, what happened and how it happened and what the dollar amount is. And the attorney has to explain to the court what is going to happen to that money and where it will go. And so the court wants to look at and make sure that everything lines up and everything is proper and that the parents will be responsible to take care of that money for the minor child as they move forward. But if the net settlement amount to the minor, if the net settlement amount to the minor exceeds $15,000, then the court says, again, we want court approval and we want a legal guardianship established. We, the parents can be the legal guardian, but we want a specific attorney that, that my firm would go out and hire to set up a guardianship and that guardianship would establish where that minor's money is placed, what kind of account it's in, under what circumstances that money can be withdrawn. Uh, a lot of times in these cases where there's a sufficient enough amount, annuities are set up for the minor children. And the annuities are based on uh, how much money is put in initially and then when and in what increments the money will be um, handed out to the minor child. So, for example, the parents, if, if they are the legal guardians and they don't have any of the underlying problems, they can set up a college annuity fund, for example that says, all right, we want the first, we want the payments to be paid out in three separate payments, for example. And we'd like the first payment to be when our child turns 18. And we'd like the second payment to be on our child's 19th birthday. And we want the third and final payment to be on our child's 20th birthday. That, that's an example. But but those legal guardianship requirements that the court places must be followed by the parents and they have to have an accounting of what's going on, what they're doing with the money, if it's still where it's supposed to be. And um, that, that way the court is certain that they've got a control, a handle on where that money goes. And then finally, if the, if the settlement amount is $50,000 or the verdict amount is $50,000 or greater, now the court wants to look at it and give its approval. 
They want a legal guardianship established, but they also want a separate third entity to called a guardian ad litem to review all of the facts, review all of the insurance coverages, review all of how the money is to be paid out, and then give an opinion to the court, an independent opinion to the court of whether the guardian ad litem thinks this is in the best interest of the minor child. But as you can see, in, in that final case, as where the settlement amounts are significant for the minor child, the court wants the most control. They want to look and look again and look again. So in those circumstances, we oftentimes have to go out and one, ask a separate independent lawyer not associated with our law firm if that lawyer is willing to be a guardian ad litem. If the lawyer is, the lawyer doesn't have to do it for free. The lawyer's fee is going to come out of that settlement agreement or that verdict amount. But, but that lawyer will sit down and review all of the information and she or he will come to an opinion about whether the settlement is fair. They don't get to say whether the verdict amount is fair, but whether how the money is being dispersed, where the money is going to, and whether that all uh, complies with Florida statutes. But in addition to that, then there has to be a separate independent lawyer hired. And that separate independent lawyer has to establish the guardianship, has to establish who the legal guardians are, has to establish where the money's going to go, how it will be spent, what type of account it will be placed in, and then submit that to the court. And then finally, once the court has all of that information, sometimes the judge says, well, I'd like to have a hearing on this matter. And I'd like to hear from the parents. I'd like to hear from the minor child. Sometimes the court says, well, no, I've got it. I, I have all of the information. I understand it and I approve it. So that's just a little bit about how complicated uh, resolving a claim that involves damages to a child can be. It's a great example of why you would want to hire a board certified trial specialist who focuses on personal injury claims because we know how to jump through the hoops. We know what hoops there are. We know what traps there are. We are always glad to try to answer your questions. We appreciate your emails. Our emails flash up on the screen, so feel free to email us. But again, I'm Randy Thompson. I am a partner in this law firm. I'm the last name partner. And I think you've probably heard Bob Kerrigan talk about this before, but it's only the lawyers in our letterhead. We don't have associates. So if you hire Bob Kerrigan, Bob Kerrigan's going to be your lawyer. If you hire Randy Thompson, Randy Thompson's going to be your lawyer, but you have the benefit of all of that. So feel free to give us a call. For over 30 years, we've been part of this great community. Kerrigan, Estes, Rankin, McLeod, and Thompson, representing accident victims across Northwest Florida. For over 30 years, we've been part of this great community. Kerrigan, Estes, Rankin, McLeod, and Thompson, representing accident victims across Northwest Florida.
Welcome back to The Law Show. I'm Mike McLeod. I'll be with you for this segment of the show. Uh, as always, The Law Show is brought to you by the law firm, Kerrigan, Estes, Rankin, McLeod, and Thompson. Our firm has represented seriously injured people across Northwest Florida for 40 years. And our attorneys and very talented staff are particularly trained and have experience helping people who, through no fault of their own, have sustained serious injuries through the fault of another person. Um, so for this segment of the show, I thought it would be interesting and helpful to talk about a concept where um, that folks may not know about that may place you in jeopardy for being responsible in an accident for an injury to someone, even though you did not participate in the accident or cause the injury. Uh, and the concept is generally called vicarious liability. And we'll use some automobile accident examples. So we know in Florida and probably all states that someone who drives negligently and causes an accident is responsible to the person that they have injured. And a lot of um, discussion and investigation goes into uh, when we get a new case where someone's injured in a car wreck, how did the accident happen? Who's at fault and cause, which driver is at fault in causing the accident? And of course we know some accidents are very clear. For example, a rear end collision is uh, not particularly complicated as far as who caused the accident. And it's not hard to um, um, consider that somebody who's negligent, who runs a red light, rear ends somebody, um, is responsible for the other person's injury. But the owner of the vehicle that causes the accident is very likely also equally responsible to the person who's injured in the accident. And again, we call that vicarious liability. And it goes back to this concept in Florida law. Um, for a, a great long while, um, the courts in Florida and the law in Florida has basically said that the owner of a dangerous instrumentality is responsible if that instrument or tool um, causes an injury to another person. And um, way back in 1920, the Florida Supreme Court, in a case that is called Southern Cotton Oil versus Anderson, in 1920, the Florida Supreme Court ruled that automobiles are a dangerous instrumentality, even though the original rule talked about dangerous tools, inherently dangerous tools. The Florida Supreme Court ruled just over a hundred years ago that automobiles are a dangerous instrumentality. And so the owner of those dangerous instruments is responsible when those things injure another person. How do we apply that in today's world? If I loan my car to a neighbor, a daughter, a grandchild, a friend, and that other person causes an accident and injures someone, they are responsible for their active negligence, but as the owner of the vehicle, <coughs> I am equally responsible and liable under the law in most cases. So that <coughs> will be, uh, should be uh, something that kind of rings a bell with us, be cautious who you loan your automobile to, you're as responsible as they are in most cases if they cause an accident. <coughs> now, and the other, Interesting thing is, if I loan my car to someone else and they cause the accident, it's my insurance as the owner who is primary as far as paying the claim for the injured person. And the person who is driving my car is also insured under my policy, but it's my insurance that's going to, as the owner, that's going to pay first. And the driver who caused the accident, their insurance if the claim is worth more than the coverage I have, 
is going to pay second. So you have a real obligation and legal liability if you own the vehicle that someone else causes an accident in. So there are some exceptions to this Florida dangerous instrumentality rule that makes you the owner responsible for other people driving your automobile. One is called the repair shop rule. So when we take our cars into a repair shop to have the car serviced or have the car repaired and the technicians who are repairing the car might take it out for a test drive or to see if the car, how the car works or to see if the repairs been uh, effective. Um, those, uh, that is an exception to the dangerous instrumentality rule and the owner is not responsible in those cases. In rental car situations, Florida has a lot of rental cars and the rental car lobby in Florida has le severely limited the liability of these rental car companies when people they rent their cars to cause an accident. And there is basically a $10,000 cap on, li on the liability of rental car companies um, when their vehicles lease to various people who lease cars throughout the state of Florida cause accident accidents. It happens all the time. There are all sorts of rental cars on the road, but the rental car lobby has gotten the Florida legislature to limit their liability to only $10,000 in every accident. So that's a second kind of exception to the Florida dangerous instrumentality rule that makes owners responsible for damages that are incurred by their vehicle, even when it's driven by someone else. So when you sell your car, I think it's very good advice for you to ensure that the title gets transferred to the new owner so that if that vehicle shortly after you sell it causes an accident, you don't get a letter from a lawyer or a person that says, hey, we, are going to hold you responsible for the damages, the injury caused by this car. And so there are some defenses to that, but I just think it's a good practice for viewers and others. If you sell your car and you don't go through a dealership, you don't trade your car in, but you just put your an ad in Auto Trader or wherever people do it now, and you sell your car in a kind of an individual private sale, it's, I think, um, healthy to make certain that the title gets transferred r rather immediately so that your name isn't sitting on the title and with somebody driving around that you don't have any uh, control over. If you have <coughs> sold your car and, and the other person really has the beneficial ownership and control over the car, I don't think you are going to ultimately be held responsible for injuries caused by your car that you sold, but you'll have to go through some steps and a kind of a nuisance to clear that up. So I think that is still a good practice. <clears throat> then finally, of course, if your car is stolen, um, then the other person doesn't have permission to be in your car. And that is a defense to you being responsible for injuries caused by your car that's been stolen and you don't have any control over <coughs> whoever uh, took your car. Now, there are some limits on liability of the owner, but they're fairly substantial. Uh, the general rule is that the owner of a vehicle is only responsible for $100,000 of intangible damages caused by someone who's um, injured by your vehicle driven by another person. There's some exceptions to that rule. If the injured person has tangible damages like medical expenses and lost wages, uh, you can still be responsible for those damages over and above the $100,000. So there is, I think the lesson in all of this for today's law show is there's some real exposure to the owner of a vehicle when they loan the, their vehicle to another person. You're equally responsible, liable, legally liable, and you can be primarily liable as far as how insurance may pay a claim. Um, another uh, kind of instance where vicarious, vicarious liability 
makes someone else responsible for another person's negligence. It's very common um, for teenagers to get their new license. And in Florida, one of the parents or guardians of the six, new 16-year-old driver has to uh, sign and authorize um, that they are legally responsible for their child um, if their 16-year-old, 17-year-old child causes an accident. And that's part of Florida's driver's license, new driver's license law. Parents still responsible for um, in the early years of getting a license for their young teenage driver. Okay, the other big example um, of vicarious liability, one person being legally responsible for the negligence and injuries caused by another is in the employer-employee situation. So employers in Florida are legally liable for the negligence of their employees if the employee is operating uh, in the scope and course of their employment. So if, um, you know, automobiles cause a lot of injuries, a lot of accidents occur as a result of automobile accidents, companies throughout Northwest Florida have drivers out on the road. If they're in the course and scope of their employment, uh, then um, the employer, the business, is responsible for the negligent acts of their employees. It's not all, it could be any circumstances, it doesn't have to be an automobile accident, but if a business has employees and conduct business and there's a warehouse or there's a department store, if, uh, uh, if a grocery store has an employee who either spills something and doesn't get it up, just leaves it, or leaves it for a long enough period that it's unreasonable to be on the floor for a long period of time. Randy Thompson is a real expert in these premises liability cases, a real expert in them. But the store is responsible for the negligent acts of their employees. Um, and that is a, a very common um, example of vicarious liability. And it's based on agency. An, uh, an agent who causes an injury through negligence uh, exposes the principal, the person the agent is working for, um, to liability in the event that the agent negligently causes uh, an injury. So those are the two big examples of vicarious liability that we see a lot in our practice of law. Um, owners of vehicles are responsible for the negligent driving of their car if they've permitted another person to drive their vehicle. And employers are responsible and liable for the negligent acts of their employees when employees do something that is careless, beneath the standard of care, uh, not prudent and, uh, and careful, then employers can be li legally liable in those cases. So these are the things, a couple of things that we see in our practice of representing and helping people who've been seriously injured in accidents is part of where we look for compensation for our injured clients. Uh, this ends this segment of The Law Show. I'm Mike McLeod, and we'll be back in just a minute with more of The Law Show. So stay tuned. Bob Kerrigan for Kerrigan Estes, Rankin, McLeod, and Thompson. What is medical malpractice? In many ways, it's similar to an auto accident. If a driver of a car is careless and causes an accident and injures someone, the driver is responsible for those injuries. If a doctor or employees of a hospital violate the rules of medicine, they're responsible for the injuries they cause. These rules of medicine make up the standard of care that doctors and hospitals are required to follow. Medical malpractice cases are expensive to bring and can be very difficult. We're required to retain qualified medical experts to assist the jury in understanding why what was done violated this standard of care. At Kerrigan Estes, Rankin, McLeod, and Thompson, we accept meritorious medical malpractice cases where substantial injuries or a death have been caused by a doctor or a hospital failing to abide by the rules of medicine. Please see our reviews on our website at kerrigan.com. Welcome back to The Law Show on this Sunday morning. 
We're going to uh, go back to our mailbag question bag and answer some questions from viewers in this final segment of the show. Uh, again, this is The Law Show brought to you by the law firm Kerrigan, Estes, Rankin, McLeod, and Thompson. Our firm specializes and has for many, many years in representing people who are seriously injured in accidents. We represent families who have lost loved ones in accidents that were not their fault. We've done it for over 40 years, and uh, we've hosted The Law Show over many, many years and appreciate uh, folks watching and and uh, hope this is an opportunity where we can provide helpful information to the community. Our web site is kerrigan.com. You can find a lot of information about the law firm, the history of the law firm, and individual information about each of the partners in the law firm. All of the lawyers with Kerrigan, Estes, Rankin, McLeod, and Thompson are partners in the law firm, all have a tremendous amount of experience, years of experience, representing people in personal injury cases, trying cases, obtaining verdicts and settlements to help people who are injured, who have economic losses, medical expense losses, and accidents that were not their fault. And we've limited our law practice just to those cases. And lawyers do a lot of other great things for people, uh, estate planning, uh, family law, divorces, criminal defense work, uh, all, sor all sorts of things. But we have, uh, almost from the inception of our firm, decided years and years ago that we just wanted to do this particular work and we wanted to be specialists. And all of the lawyers who practice and handle cases here at the law firm are board certified civil trial lawyers. And a very small percent of the Florida lawyers, uh, of Florida lawyers are board certified at all, and certainly in this area of law. My name is Mike McLeod. Uh, my email address is on the screen now. It's mike.mcleod at kerrigan.com. You can send me an email a question to me at that address. We'll answer it on the TV show, or I'll reply to your email. Uh, again, it's mike.mcleod at kerrigan.com, or you can text us at our main number, 850-444-4444. That number is answered also, if you call that number, throughout the week, and actually 24 hours a day, seven days a week, we can be reached uh, at that number. So let's answer uh, a few more questions that have come in over the last week or two. Um, the first question is, how much does it cost to hire a lawyer in a personal injury case in Florida? So, um, and we've talked about this before, uh, lawyers who do this sort of work and who handle this these types of cases charge what is called a contingency fee. And the fee is contingent upon a successful outcome. So all those other types of things that lawyers do, criminal defense work, uh, divorces, uh, adoptions, estate planning, business issues, lawyers typically charge uh, either a fixed fee ahead of time or an hourly fee, depending on how much time is involved in the matter. In personal injury cases, the contingency fee allows someone who may have modest means or who does not want to pay a lawyer uh, up front, whether the case is successful or not, to hire the best lawyers they can hire. And the fee is typically a third of the recovery, dependent, again, on a successful outcome in the case. So, um, if a person comes into our office who's been seriously injured in an accident, we will put the full force of our firm, and we have very talented staff who's, who most of them have done this work and who, who have worked for us for a long period of time. Um, we will put that group of talented people and lawyers uh, 
forward to assist you to make sure you are treated fairly as a result of an injury resulting from an accident that was not your fault. And the fee uh, is not paid at up front. The fee is not paid at all unless there is a successful outcome. And so this allows the client to hire the best lawyers they can hire and not to pay unless there is a successful outcome in the case. And then again, uh, also, uh, there are certain expenses that go along with pursuing a serious injury case. And those expenses can typically be uh, the cost of acquiring your medical records. Physicians and hospitals charge for the copying of records when the client needs them or when the lawyer representing a client needs them. So we pay all of those charges uh, as the case goes along. Sometimes uh, when we get records for the at-fault driver, what kind of driving record does this person have? We do a lot of research into, well, how is this person who caused this accident driven in the past? So we get their driving record. We get a lot of history and information on the person who caused the accident. That's available. Um, sometimes we hire uh, experts who uh, have a specific training in certain aspects of how a case happened, not necessarily always an automobile accident, but other types of accidents. Um, and, and then sometimes we will meet with a client's treating physician in order to have the doctor project how is this person going to do after the case is over. What's this injury? How is this injury going to affect them as they go forward in life? And so doctors charge for those conferences and for their time for providing this helpful information that helps us put forward our client's case. So uh, the contingency fee is one that's not paid unless there's a successful outcome. The costs that we incur pursuing those cases, the things that I've, those examples that I've just given, um, are not charged to the client at all um, unless there's a successful outcome. So what, what, do, what do lawyers like about the contingency fee? If a lawyer is uh, uh, talented and, uh, and able to get a very positive outcome in the case, the lawyer is going to be compensated for the work that he or she does. And what do the clients like about the contingency fee? I can hire the best lawyers I can find, and I don't have to pay them anything unless they're successful in the case. And it opens the courthouse door and evens the odds against insurance companies. Typically, it's an insurance company who have plenty of lawyers, plenty of employees who are all, all experienced in handling these cases. So it evens the odds for people that will find it hard to risk funds up front to make sure they are fairly compensated in an accident. All right, so um, next question was, what if uh, the driver who hit me was drinking? So um, let's talk a little bit about drunk driver accidents. If a, if, a, if a driver in another vehicle runs a stop sign, runs a red light, the most common accident really is a rear end collision. It's just human nature. We get distracted by different things. Cell phones are, of course, a big problem. But um, drivers get distracted, so it's very common for a person to come to see us and have significant neck or back problems as a result of a real rear end collision. Um, so if a drunk driver rear ends you, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't mean that they're more responsible. If a car rear ends you, that driver is negligent in most cases and responsible for your damages. But if the driver rear ends you and is intoxicated, then the case sometimes takes on uh, different qualities. One, insurance companies that insure drunk drivers are, in our experience, more alerted to the fact that this is a case where a jury may award more money because our insured was intoxicated than if the insured just looked down to try and pick up a, a pen that was dropped or something that was dropped because 
the fault part of the case is more aggravated. And we know historically that juries in Northwest Florida, and I'm sure juries everywhere, tend to compensate people that are injured with the same injury in a, in a more substantial way because the at-fault driver was so careless as to drive while drinking. And so w we think that cases where the at-fault driver was intoxicated result in bigger damages, even though the damages are the same as mom or pop who causes an accident inadvertently by running a red light. The second kind of difference that I would mention about drunk driver accidents is that in the typical case, a person injured in an accident has the right to be compensated for their compensatory damages in just the average case. And compensatory damages are lawful damages in Florida um, that, are, that are aimed to compensate the injured person and to compensate them for their lost wages, their medical expenses. These are bills that they have to make the injured person whole. And in Florida, in an automobile accident, if you have a permanent injury, you're entitled to be compensated for intangible type damages for pain and suffering, loss of the ability to do the things that you could do and enjoy the things that you could do before the accident. But these are all damages to compensate the injured person. In Florida, if the at-fault driver is intoxicated to the extent that their normal faculties are impaired, the injured person also has a right to claim not just compensatory damages, but punitive damages. And punitive damages are not necessarily measured by, well, what happened to the injured party, but what is the bad conduct of the wrongdoing party? Um, how bad was the person intoxicated? Is this the second or third DUI that the at-fault driver had? So in Florida, if the at-fault driver is intoxicated, then the injured person has the ability to recover not just compensatory damages, but punitive damages, damages that are measured to punish the at-fault wrongdoing driver. There are some procedural steps that have to be taken by your lawyer, if you've hired a lawyer, before you can trigger punitive damages. And just basically, um, those things are um, you have to get into the record the evidence that this person was intoxicated or this person's conduct was so reckless as to be uh, tre tremendously reckless. And then um, you have to ask the court to allow you to amend your complaint to seek punitive damages. Um, so there are some differences in cases that lawyers who do this can uh, trigger punitive damages to punish the wrongdoer. Um, I've got some, we'll have some more questions answered next week. I've run out of time for this segment in the show. I'm Mike McLeod. This is The Law Show brought to you by Kerrigan Estes, Rankin, McLeod, and Thompson. And we'll be back again next week.